So with this practice, it's natural that at some times there'll be peace, and at some times there won't be. On occasions, the level of our mind falls, and there's just no inner calm. Any calm that we once did have just deteriorates and carries on uh, dropping, carries on falling from our hearts. And the samadhi that we once had, this firmness, stability of mind, uh, starts becoming very shaky. So even though before we may have experienced uh, both the body and the mind feeling buoyant, that the mind can gather together into a state of upajara samadhi or neighborhood concentration. Um, but this may just disappear from the heart. So sometimes it's normal for the mind to be in a concentrated state and sometimes for it not to be that way. But what's important is for us to maintain our mindfulness and to have an object of awareness that we keep in mind. And this is even more the case when the mind doesn't have samadhi. Our sati, our mindfulness, becomes even more important then. And we need to contemplate, contemplate the inconstant nature of samadhi. And ask ourselves, um, this samadhi, uh, these feelings of peace, are they something stable, are they constant, are they sure or not? Are they something that we can depend upon and are reliable? So when the mind is peaceful, then we teach it that this peace is something inconstant. It's not sure. And when it's not peaceful, then we teach it that it's inconstant. It's not sure as well. And we try to not become discouraged or disheartened. So if our mind does fall, what this shows us is that our mindfulness is weak, our samadhi is not settled, and wisdom is unable to arise. So at those times then we need to use, um, or we need to teach our minds, and ask ourselves, well, who is it that is feeling uh, chaotic, who's feeling disturbed, who's feeling discouraged? And we should do a lot of walking meditation and just carry on walking until we feel very fatigued. And when the body does feel tired in this way, then this feeling of discouragement that we have in our heart will be replaced by the exhaustion of the body. And we can ask ourselves, well, that feeling that we once had of being disheartened, was that me? So whenever any feelings come up, um, we ask ourselves, are these really me? Are they mine? Because it's natural that we have the sense of self and they claim ownership over all the emotions that we experience. Anything that we experience, uh, the mind takes possession of. So, and when there's a sense of me, then there's also a sense of you or them. And this shows that the mind is in a deluded state. So we must teach our minds that these things are inconstant, they're not sure. The one who is tired, who is that? In this body, is it really me? And when the mind uh, separates out from the body, then does the body still feel exhausted then? So these uh, feelings, they depend on the functioning of the body as well. So there's the sense contact, and then that gets sent to the brain. And that then informs the mind that there is pain in different places. But if our nerves aren't functioning well, then they're not able to send these messages to the brain, and there's no perception of sensation. (laughs) So our bodies are filled with these nerve pathways and nerve endings. And that's what allows us to feel these various physical feelings that we do, and these get sent to the brain. But really, the body is just a collection of elements, it's a heap of elements, and it doesn't actually feel anything itself. And if the brain isn't working well, 
um, then there's no sensation. And when the body dies, then there's no feeling of pain, there's no feeling of exhaustion, of heat, of any of these things. So we should instruct our minds in this way. And through this, they'll be able to gather together. If they do gain a sense of peace and uh, the mind becomes quite firm, then it's possible for it to separate out from the body. And any physical pain that we might feel will lessen. And this is because uh, the mind or the, the attachment that the mind has towards the body has lessened as well. But this uh, happens bit by bit. So, and when this happens, then uh, the peace that we experience internally increases. So sometimes we're feeling disheartened. Sometimes we're very enthusiastic and energetic. But what's important is to try to make the practice smooth and even. And the developing of samadhi can be quite a struggle. And it's not just one day that it happens in. For those people whose minds are able to gather together very quickly, it shows that they've got a lot of bharami, a lot of spiritual maturity. And so they're able to do it easily. But as difficult as samadhi is, the maintenance of it, the sustaining of that samadhi is even more difficult. And just as Lumpur Cha taught that building a monastery isn't so difficult, it doesn't take all that long to do. It may be two or three years that uh, there's a lot of work, a lot of activity, uh, but after that it's finished. But once it's been completed, we have to look after it for the rest of our lives. We have to sweep it and mop it and brush away the cobwebs and uh, make sure that everything's working well and repair anything. If the roof is leaking, then we have to repair that. And so there's this constant maintenance and care that we have to take of us that uh, lasts our entire lives. And this is far more difficult. So initially, when I heard Lumpur Cha say this, I thought that actually building the monastery would be far more difficult because it seemed like so much work. But after time, having thought and contemplated his teaching, I realized that it really is that way. And that as difficult as building it is, uh, maintaining it is far more difficult. And so it's the same for our samadhi. In order to sustain that samadhi, we need to be very cautious, cautious around our speech, to speak little, to sleep little, to always be looking after our minds. And so they can maintain this level of peace. And so this takes our endurance and persistence as well. And the Buddha taught that this quality of kanti, of patient endurance, is the dhamma or the quality that will that burns up the defilements. It's the quality that all wise people have in their hearts. So as the Buddha said, uh, kanti paramanta potitika, uh, that as kanti, patient endurance, is the supreme incinerator of defilements. So we've chanted this and we've read this, but we also need to put it into practice as well because this is how the Buddha taught, and this is how the Buddha himself uh, followed uh, in practice. And this Dhamma is something that's very amazing, but we need to, to really use it. And so the Buddha had great patient endurance in his practice, and the Bharami, the spiritual maturity that he had was great. And he had to go through so many difficulties. In order to uh, develop that Bhairami for countless lifetimes. So when we're feeling discouraged, then we can um, ask ourselves, well, is, is this really it? You know, compared to the Buddha, the pain that we're feeling, the difficulties that we're going through are so minute. 
It's like just a tiny speck of dust in the vast, endless universe. We can't even compare to the difficulties that the Buddha went through. So we think in this way to raise up our our powers of endurance and see that um, sometimes there is the state of samadhi and sometimes there's not, and that's just normal. And it was for the same for the Buddha in some of his previous lives as well, uh, that even though he had ordained, he didn't experience any samadhi whatsoever. So there was one time when he went off to ordain in a previous life as the Bodhisattva, and one of his friends got bitten by a very venomous snake. And so he made the editana, the determination, uh, or resolution of truth, uh, that even though I have ordained, I haven't experienced any happiness whatsoever. I've experienced no samadhi, no calm. And through the power of this truth, may this uh, venom leave or not harm my friend's body. And so with that, then uh, the venom was just extracted from his body. So this was the power of the the Buddha's uh, barami of truth, of satcha, and also of aditana, his resolution. So even though he didn't have any peace whatsoever in his holy life, uh, still he had this truth with him. So we should tell ourselves that we will walk this path, we will carry on practicing, we'll put our effort into the practice as a homage to the Buddha. But sometimes, even though internally things are just in a mess, um, the mind is very chaotic and scattered, but still we put our effort in, and we do this in homage to the Buddha. And as we practice sincerely, then the energy in our hearts is raised up. And when we're feeling exhausted or tired, then we have mindfulness over that and see that this is just a feeling that arises and ceases. As we carry on practicing, then the mind will at some point gather into samadhi and feel very contented, very full. So therefore, we need to put our efforts in, into uh, practicing meditation, into developing samadhi, and this will uh, fruit in wisdom. And when wisdom comes up, and when it's on top of things, then suffering just can't arise. Even though there may be no peace in our hearts, still suffering can't arise, because we're able to teach ourselves teach ourselves that samadhi is inconstant and that peace doesn't last. If we can do this, then we're developing upeka, this quality of equanimity. And this is one of the bojangas, one of the uh, factors for awakening and something that's very, very important. So a few of the other factors are piti or rapture, and there's also the peace of heart and our energy. But the end, or the last quality of this, is upeka. And this is when the mind isn't given to liking or disliking. It's in a state of equipoise. And this is the path to taking us to seeing the Dhamma. It's something that everyone is able to practice, that lay people can practice at home as well even though maybe with a wife or a husband, with children there, and a job to work, and still we can develop this path. And as we meditate, as we keep our minds with the wholesome object, then even though externally things might be chaotic, but internally we can free ourselves from that chaos. And the mind can, for periods, feel very spacious, feel very at ease. So we tell ourselves that we'll use certain parts of the day to practice in this way.
and tell ourselves that this is the time for us to train our minds, that we're not going to get involved with any of these things. We're not going to get involved with anything at all. And in doing this, we're taking Nibbāna as the object of our minds. And nibbāna is an emptiness that's pure and complete. So the, and it's a state that the Buddha himself reached in his own mind. So the Buddha, the perfectly awakened Buddha, his mind was pure at all times. And he taught us to follow this path that will take us to realize our inner Buddha, the Buddha in our own hearts. So when we are determined to walk this path of practice, when we are sincere in building up goodness in our lives, then its natural obstacles will also arise because this is something that's not so easy to do. So in coming to the monastery, some people get sick and it's difficult for them to come. Or it may be raining very hard, a storm might blow in. Or sometimes people think in ways that make them exhausted. And this becomes an obstruction, it becomes an internal mara. At other times, other people's thoughts might hamper our efforts as well. Um, they may try to discourage us. They say that we have gone crazy on merit. And why is it that we need to go and seek out so much goodness, that we have gone mad on this stuff? You may tell us that while we're still so young, why are we interested in the Dhamma? Are we insane? So I had this experience myself, actually, when I was younger. Um, I was working as an accountant and secretary uh, when I was 22 years old, but I wanted to go off to ordain. And there was a man who previously was a monk, and he had ordained for many years. Uh, and he had studied Bali to quite a high level. Uh, but then he left the monastic life. So when he found out that I wanted to ordain, he asked me, well, aren't you going too far? But I still persisted anyway, even though he tried to discourage me. And I really wanted to go off and become a monk. And I knew that it was something that was quite difficult to do. It felt like I had just a tiny boat in the great ocean. And it was very easy for that to get blown over, for it to capsize. That the wind blows, the rain comes in, the storm comes, and waves start rocking the boat. And to pass over to the other shore is something that's very tough. So having just a small boat means that our barami isn't so much. But if our boat is very large, then that means our spiritual maturity is great. It means that we've created a lot of this uh, barami and through our practice of sila, of virtue, of generosity, of developing samadhi and developing wisdom, and all these different aspects of the paramitas. And this is a big boat. It's something that's able to cross over. But if we've only got a tiny dinghy, then what are we going to do? If we try to go by ourselves, just in this tiny dinghy, then it's not going to happen. We're just going to make it 50 meters and the thing will start sinking. So we have to depend upon a larger boat, something that's able to take us across. And so there are those boats that have crossed over already, that have reached the other shore, but they have the compassion to send their boat back to pick us up. And so Lumpur Cha, he had this very big boat, and uh, he had crossed over and had become a Savaka Buddha himself a uh, disciple of the Buddha, that someone who had realized that same state of awakening, that he had followed the Buddha's teachings. And so 
a tiny dinghy and just can't get there. We need to depend upon a larger boat. And just like we've all seen or maybe traveled in uh, these giant ferries that are able to take many different vehicles inside them, you can even put a big bus inside them. Um, and so these ferries are able to take our boat across. If we try to go ourselves, or if that bus tries to get over, to cross over itself, it won't be able to go at all. So we have to depend upon these larger boats. We depend upon the wisdom and upon the spiritual maturity of our teacher. Those who have followed the Buddha's teachings until they have become true disciples of the Buddha have realized that same state of awakening. And they teach us, they instruct us, and we try to follow their teachings as best we can. And if we do that, then we can progress quickly, and we have a chance to know and see the Dhamma for ourselves. So for those whose spiritual maturity is not so great, um, but they have a great teacher that they can depend upon, then they can progress all the same. And when Lumpur Cha taught this, <coughs> um, then I felt um, it went very, this teaching went very deeply into my heart. And so I really tried to practice in line with his teachings. But he taught us outside of the rain retreat that we should stay in our umbrella tents at the root of a tree. And so I did that. And I'd stay there until the rain started falling. Uh, usually <clears throat> the rain would come around in May, and then I'd go back into my kuti. So even though I was living at one number upon, I still took up this practice. And also the practice of eating all my food in just the one bowl, eating just one time a day, and wearing uh, robes that were made from disca discarded cloth. All of these practices are for the purpose of bringing our minds to peace so that they settle into samadhi. And this then fruits in wisdom, in knowing and seeing the truth. So lay people are able to do this as well. And lay people can make their minds into the mind of a true monastic. Well, the, the word in Thai prat means both monk and also that which is noble. And so lay people can too make their minds noble. But this relies upon our training, upon our efforts, upon the goodness that we create, the merit that we do. And it's natural that there will be obstacles, there will be maras that come to hinder us, but we're able to pass through them if we don't believe them. So we just carry on building up our spiritual maturity, creating more merit, putting in our efforts to pass through these obstacles. And the way that we overcome them is through the efforts that we have. We also should ask ourselves very frequently, why were we born? For what purpose were we born? And what do we want to get from this life? And the things that we have here, are they going to stay with us? So we ask ourselves these questions frequently, and in doing so, wisdom arises. So may all of you be sincere, have your hearts set upon this practice, and may all of you develop in the Dhamma and grow in blessings.